thank you for coming and uh, join us to, if you feel like a senior, I'll be checking IDs. <laughs> checking IDs. So make sure that you don't come out when you're not a senior. So I'm going to dedicate today's sermon to you seniors. We really do honor you. And I've taken your favorite verse today. We are going to look at John 3, verse 16. And we are going to try and break this passage apart. I have never preached on John 3, 16, but I love it. I've referred to it many times in different ways. But as we focus on the love of God, today I'm going to talk about no greater love. No greater love. And our focus is going to be on John chapter 6, 3, verse 16. John chapter 3, verse 16. So pull out your notes, if you may. Um, and you want to grab a pen, and a, a pencil or whatever, and follow as we go through. Amen. Okay. Are we ready with PowerPoint? A minute? Okay. We all know John 3, 16, don't we? Okay. If you don't know it, just move your lips so that people will think that you know it. Let's all go together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's say it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever This is considered to be the most famous Bible passage in all the Bible. And I believe that if the Bible is stolen or banned from the planet Earth, and all that we have is John 3.16, we will survive. I said we will survive. Because in this verse, we have everything that we need for the gospel. John 3.16 is loaded with theology. And today we are going to look at seven fundamental truths I see in this verse. If I could preach a whole month on this verse. It's all our favorite verses. And as you know, one of um, football players, Tim Tebow, has considered John 3.16 as one of his favorite verses where he writes this across the eye black under his eyes. It's interesting that in 2011 playoff game, according to the Associate Press, he had six, 316 rushing yards, an average 31.6 per completion. And after that game, Google almost crashed. 90 million people went to Google to search what John 316 means. It became the most searched term on Google after that pl playoff game in 2011. John chapter 3, verse 16. What does it mean? Let's start with the first one. And they all will begin with the letter E to help you to remember. The first one, God's love is extravagant. Amen? Extravagant love. Now let's go to 316 again. The Bible says, what do I mean by extravagant? It simply means, for God so loved. Now, I was thinking about the word so this morning. The word so can be used as an, an adjective or, or an adverb. It means to some extent, define the extent it will also define, not just the extent, but also the intensity. When it describes a noun or describes an adjective, it referring to the extent, how big, how wide is my description. When somebody says, this food is so amazing, it's not just saying amazing, you want to say, I need to put another adverb to qualify the adjective. In other words, the ad adjective is not enough to carry how I love the food. So when you use the word so, you are trying to express the degree or the intensity. So it describes the extent, the intensity, and also the degree by which something is so good or something is so powerful. 
And when the Bible describes God's love for us, it didn't just say God loved the world. The Bible says he so loved the world. You know what that was? What that means is that God is crazy about us. And I've been saying this since the beginning of this series. God is so crazy about you and I. So crazy. So crazy about us. In Ephesians chapter 2, now this is not just in one verse. When the Bible describes God's love for us, it describes this degree, this extent. It said, but God, so rich in mercy, and he loves us what? So much. That even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And he talks about, by grace, are you saved? I don't think that I will ever be able to phantom or grasp how much God loves me. Like I've explained a few weeks ago, because of our brokenness and our sin, it will going to be very difficult for us to get it. But he does. Contrary to what you think about God, who is a big grandfather up there holding a cane, can't wait for you to make mistakes so that he can hit you, that's not the image of God the Bible describes. This is an image of God who is so love us. God so loved us. And Paul himself in Ephesians chapter 3, and we have read this over and over again, he says, and may you have the power to understand. Because we don't about this love thing. In the King James, he says, I pray that you have a revelation of this love. As all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is his love is. I pray that you get it. He said, may you experience the love of Christ. Though it's too great to understand fully, then you'll be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. I tell you, the love of God is powerful. Like I said to you a few weeks ago, when we understand the love of God, it will change everything. It will change the way we look at ourselves the way we care about people, the way we look at the world, the way even we go through the storm and tribulation. God's love is so extravagant. Then the second thing he talks about is God's love is extensive. God's love is extensive. Let's go back to the verse again. First he said, God so loved the world. God, not only love, is ob the object of his affection is the world. Contrary to what you and I think, God loves everybody. Hmm, I didn't get an amen. <laughs> Sometimes we think God only loves us because we go to church. Or only Christians. Our bad news for you. He loves everybody. In fact, his soul loves everybody. He didn't say, for God so loved the church. Or God so loved the righteous people. He said, God so loved the world. One day somebody came to Jesus and he said, what does it mean to love my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? They were thinking, my fellow church member, my fellow brother or sister. And Jesus gave them the parable, now we call it the parable of the good Samaritan. And he told him about a man who was not in church, a man who was not in the synagogue, a man who was not part of the neighborhood, but the man has been traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho where he has been beaten and left half dead. Now, you want to talk about who I love? Jesus is saying, this is the person I want you to love. The people that God loves is the world, and that includes everybody. Let me describe the world a bit. Let me talk about first the composition of the world. When the Bible says God loved the world, what does it, what does it mean, the composition? One, it means God loves every race. Not just black people. 
Although I've always thought they, 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 they were special. But God likes white people. He, he likes yellow people. He likes green people. He likes blue people. God likes everybody. And when God comes to church, he wants to see everybody that he loves. That is why it breaks my heart. When you go to a church, it's all white church. You know what we are saying? God loves only white people. When you go to a black church, you say, God loves only black people. Don't get quiet on me. You know what I'm talking about. God loves only Filipino people. Redeem Alliance Filipino Church. God only loves Filipino people. When he said go to the world and preach the gospel, for us, our world is Filipino. Oh, Pastor Sam, God has reached me to reach the Africans in the lower mainland. What kind of nonsense is that? God said go to the world. And the world is everybody. And when he went to church, he saw only Jews. And the Bible says he was angry and he was upset. And he, he turned the tables upside down. And he said, have you not read my house? Shall be a house of prayer for all nations. Somebody say, hey. The church must be a church of all people because he loves all people. Why are we only reaching this particular people, that particular people, and that particular people? God wants us to reach everyone. God so loved the world. And I want you to understand what the world means to God when he say love them. Everybody, in respect of their race. Don't just come to my church because it's a black church. Come to my church. No, God loves everybody. Come to my church anyway. And if your church is all white church, tell your pastor to change it. Say, Pastor, I have friends that are black people. And then welcome here. I have Filipino friends. I have Chinese friends. Come on, let's change something in this church so that we can reach the whole world. For God so loved the world. And that includes anybody from any religion. He loves them. That's part where they are. That's part they're struggling. That's part the father they are off. He loves the Muslims. God loves the Muslims. God loves the Hindus. God loves anybody in every religion. He loves them. He cares about them. They may be off. They may be wrong. But God loves them anyway. He loves anybody from any race, from any religion, and anybody from any resources. Sometimes I get people thinking the poorer, the poorer you are, the more God loves you. What kind of nonsense is that? God loves the poor. He loves the rich. In fact, the Bible says one day a rich man came to Jesus and began to ask questions. And the Bible says Jesus looked at him and he loved him. God loves everybody. So when, when, when you have money, don't feel guilty that you have money. If you feel guilty, come and, come and give your money to me. You should feel guilty when you are not sharing your money. You should feel guilty when you are keeping it to yourself. You should feel guilty when you, are keep, when you are holding it and people are suffering around you. You should feel guilty. But as long as you are giving, as long as you are sharing what God has given you, then enjoy what you have. If you want to fly from West Van to Surrey, by all means fly. And please give me a ride. Somebody said, Pastor, I'm feeling guilty driving this car. You, you give the car to me. I am guilt-free zone. If God has blessed you and you are sharing that worth and you are beginning to touch others, then God bless you. But of course, they are greedy rich people who want to keep everything to themselves. Those are the ones Jesus said it's very difficult for them to enter into the kingdom of God. Because their riches have become their God. Become their source of strength and it's become the, their sustainer. It's become their, their God. Those the Bible won. They were rich. Jesus was surrounded by rich people who supported his ministry. In fact, when he died, he was buried in the rich man's tomb. There's nothing wrong with having money. It's having money and having the right idea of money. Rather than God has given me money just not for myself. I am just a tunnel by which God is going to flow his, his riches through me. Can God trust you with riches? Some of you, God can't trust us with riches. Because the moment that we get rich, we'll not even come to church anymore. Because we'll be lying on our water bed. Coo -coo 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 -coo. <laughs> well, I, I live in West Van now. I can't, I can't drive to Surrey. Surrey is too far. I have to cross. Patella Bridge will swallow me. <laughs> God can't trust you with riches. Some of you come here because we are in Surrey. If this church were in Northern, oh, it's too far, it's too far, it's too far. I can't go. 
Can God trust you? Can you still be faithful to God? Come to prayer meeting. Come to church every Sunday, although you've been blessed. Can you be able to look at needs around you and bless others? God loves everybody. Now, that is the composition of the world. He also loves the condition of the world. God understands the condition of the world by which he has called us. So when we talk about the world, we talk about not just the composition, we are also talking about the condition. Man is in a very, the world is in a very terrible condition. God understands, and don't get me wrong. When I say God loves the world, I'm not saying that God loves what they are doing. God understands, and he did something about it. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He understands that our situation, man's situation is really, really terrible. Watch as the book of Ephesians describes our state. Just watch this. What a revelation. Thank you. The Bible says, you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we were all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our own flesh and fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath just as others. This is man's condition in the world. This is the condition that God still loves us. Let me break these verses apart so we understand. The first thing he talks about is, say, look, I want you to understand the condition of man is dead. We are dead. What do you mean by dead? Dead means that we don't respond to God. He said, you were dead in your trespasses. You, you were, God has made you alive who were dead in sin. What does it mean to be dead in sin? Dead means that you don't respond to stimuli. You don't respond to the gospel. When you share the gospel to somebody who is dead, it is nothing to him. It is foolishness to him. It doesn't make sense. He doesn't understand why you wake up every Sunday morning to go to church. He doesn't understand why you worship this God. But then he will go and worship a park called hockey. He doesn't get it that God Almighty is the one that sustains you. They don't get it. It doesn't make sense to them for you to come and sing songs to the Almighty God, but they can sing songs in a hockey game. They don't get it. It doesn't make sense to them. We were dead, and all of us, we were dead. We used to laugh at people who were Christians and say, these people are just a crutch and all the rest, until you found Jesus. And God began to change something within you. He began to put joy in your soul. You begin to understand peace and rest. Oh, you wake up in the morning and you are ready to conquer the world because through Christ you are more than a conqueror. The joy of the Lord became your strength. His peace has gathered you. Oh, I feel like preaching here this morning. His peace has gathered your mind and your heart. All of a sudden the gospel makes sense. You know why? Because you are alive. You are alive to God. You are alive to prayer. Now you come and you sing songs and you cry. Your spirit is now responding to God. And some of you, you could be in church all your life, but you are dead. You don't respond to prayer. You don't respond to God. You don't respond to the word. Nothing moves you. Your spirit is dead. You can be in the church and you can be dead. Your spirit has to become alive. In other words, the things of God must excite you. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. When somebody invited you to a prayer meeting, you were excited. When somebody said, hey, it's time for church, you were excited. You don't go, oh, church again, you are dead. You are dead. Your spirit is not responding. If you rather watch TV than go to church, then your spirit is not respond, responding to spiritual things. It is responding to carnal and to fleshy things. Am I preaching the gospel here today? The Bible says we were dead. He also said that we were deceived by the prince of the power of the air. Let's go back to the verse and see. He said, not only were we dead, you who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the world, of the, of the air. It's the devil that deceives us. Look at the world. 
The Bible said the whole world lies in darkness under the deception of the enemy. And they believe in all kinds of stupidity and foolishness. Sometimes people believe in stuff and you're like, what kind of nonsense is this? Cross your leg, cross your feet. This is my God. What kind of foolishness is this? People go, I was watching a documentary the other day. People go into a river in India and bath this dirty water, hoping that something will happen to them. People have been deceived. North America, we have been deceived that when you have money, you have a property, you have everything, you're going to be happy. The devil deceives us because money don't make people happy. Properties don't make people happy. Are you understanding what I'm saying? It is the law. The Bible says, blessed is he, blessed is he, blessed is he. It is Jesus Christ that makes us happy. And some of you, you are listening to me this morning and you are deceived. You keep doing the things all over again, all over again, hoping that something will change, something will bring you joy. You can change girlfriends, you can change iPhones, you can change your wife, you can move away from Suri. Nothing is going to bring you joy. Joy comes from the Lord. Jesus said, I will give you joy and no one... We, were, we have been under the deception of the prince of the air. The Bible says, I believe in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, that if our gospel be preached, we have to realize that Satan has blinded the minds of people. Does it make sense? I watch the world every day. I see the world every day and I'm like, why are people believing this stupidity? Why are we even following these Hollywood stars whose life is so much immersed? They are coming from drug habilitation. They can't keep, keep away from drug keep away from trouble. They are, look at what happened to Justin Bieber. Poor guy. The guy is a mess. Fame is not going to bring you true satisfaction. He is looking for something. He needs to encounter Jesus Christ. We were dead. We were deceived. And the Bible also said that we were also disobedient, meaning that we don't care. We were dead, we were deceived, we were disobedient. Go back to the verse, to, to the next verse. It talks about the spirit now works in the, in the sons of disobedient. This is a condition of the world. We just want to do anything that we know God says is wrong, we want to do it. Because we have the spirit of disobedience, the spirit of rebellion inside us. We're just going to walk away from God. We don't care about God and we don't know. We, we, we don't have everything. At the end of the service, we are going to Pray for the Malaysian airline. This is up here. And the world is crumbling. It shouldn't be. This is our world. We've created our airplanes. We have not had anything. Planes can't just disappear. You don't have the world. It is not under your control. We are all under the mercy and the grace of the living God. You can create your planes and you can make them. They could disappear. Everybody's in panic mood. What happened to it? Was it terrorism? Was it a mistake? We didn't hear anybody. We just, we just lost them. We think we have created technology so we are unconquerable. We are invisible. You're not. The reason why we take off and we land is by the grace of the living God, not your technology. So anytime you fly and you land, and some of you know me, I pray a lot when I'm flying. Because I am scared up there. I don't trust your technology. In fact, I was telling my wife yesterday, you see? You see why I don't like to fly? You see? You see? This is coming to confirm my fears. I'm supposed to travel very soon. I'm even thinking about it. Oh, planes don't go down. These days, it's safer to be in a plane than a, a car. I'd rather be in my car. Because I know the car is on the ground. I control it. In the air. We're all under the mercy of God. We can't just walk away from God and do everything we want to do because we think we are God. We're not. We're not. There's so much about this world we don't even know. And yet we think we don't need God. We want to do everything against God and everything the Bible speaks against in the Bible. We are going to promote it. We are going to legislate it. We're going to make it a law. It's almost like God in your face. We walk in the disobedience, that's the condition of the world. And he also talk about the depravity. The world is also depraved. Not only are we dis disobedient, the Bible says that we are just corrupted. 
Our minds are just corrupted. Watch this. Watch the next verse. He said, the spirit now who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we were once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. He said, no, we were just messed up. You and I, we are all messed up. And by the grace of God, God is working through us. I don't know how messed up I was until I got married. Let me, let me make a confession to you. I thought, okay, I'm, I'm not going to say it. You guys are going to laugh at me. Do you promise that you not laugh at me? I used to be attracted a lot to these women. And I said, I'm going to get married, and I'm going to be free. Then I got married, and I'm still attracted to women. And I'm like, what is this? Don't look at me, you don't know what I'm talking about. I thought once I got married, that was it. When I see a woman, I'll just see a human being. That's not true. What is happening to me? And I told my wife, why am I still looking? I thought once I married the most beautiful woman on earth, I'll never look again. But I look. You know why? I am depraved. There is depravity. You know what I am talking about. If you want to look at me with your holier than thou and father sick eye, that is your problem. Don't tell me that since you've been married, you have never looked at another woman. Don't, don't give me your holy look and look at your husband, your wife. Like, That's your problem. Me, I have looked. I have looked. And I'm like, why am I looking? You have a beautiful woman by your side. Why are you looking? Depravity. Depravity. God is still working on me. One day I will not look anymore. Not, not, not yet. But one day. <laughs> I can't promise you it's over yet. Because my wife is listening. She's my witness. It's not yet. But I'm getting there. Just getting there. It's depravity. It's sin within us that we must learn to conquer. That is why Christ came to set us free and break the yoke of sin within us. It is the depravity, it is the lust of the flesh and of the eye. We want to see what we're not supposed to see. Touch what we're not supposed to touch. It's a sin within us. And Christ said this is the condition of the world. You are married, you are not married, you know you're not supposed to be sleeping together, but you are doing it. Why? The world tells us it's okay. The world is not our barometer. The world is not telling us what to do. We have to get back into the Bible. The fact that it's all right in the, in, in the movie doesn't make it right. The fact that you see it always on TV doesn't make it right. Let me tell you something about sex. The world has cheapened sex so much that you guys got to know the truth. It's not just people who just want to have fun. No. The Bible says when you have sex with somebody, you become one flesh. Your soul and your spirit and your body become intertwined with that person. You can't just get up and walk away, put on your pants, you think it's over. No, your soul has been intertwined. What a shock. <laughs> a few days ago, I was talking to a wife. I said, Pastor, I just happened to come across my former boyfriend. Why am I having feelings? I've been married. I have three children. I said, depravity, if you don't stop it, kill it, it will destroy you. You become one soul to this person. That is why you want to keep your body, sisters. Keep your body, brothers, until you get married. Otherwise, you will be in bed with three, four people on the same bed when you are married. The world will not tell you that. That's why we are so messed up. That is why, especially for a woman, when there's a breakup, it is so deep. We guys don't get it. It's so deep, it feels like something has been wrenched away from her soul. Sex is a serious thing. God takes it seriously. And that is why he wanted it to happen in the context of marriage. The father, we are attracted to something that's not making it right. The father, I'm attracted to something that's not make it right. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's a depravity. The father, I am a brother. I am attracted to another brother. That's not make it right. It is depravity. It is sinful. It is not right. You say, well, pastor, well, I'm attracted to this brother. I'm a brother because I, I've been born in sin. We've all been born in sin. And if you're a sister, you're attracted to a sister. It doesn't make it right. Even though the world says it's right. Even though the law says it's right. It doesn't make it right. 
Because we are all born in iniquity and in sin, and all of us, different people, express this de depravity different way. I express it through something else. You, as a guy, may, may express it through another guy. It doesn't make it right. It is not why Jesus Christ came to die to deliver us from this depravity. That I was hearing in the news the other day, a man wants to marry his dog, and he said, This is right. And, and I go, why not? If guys can marry guys, why not? This is right. Is it not? What's wrong if a man marries his own dog? What's wrong? The world is going on a path of depravity. Whether you are married and you are committing adultery, or you are a single man and you are sleeping together with somebody that you are not supposed to, or you are a guy, you are trying to another guy, it doesn't matter. All oh, is sin. And we express it. One sin does not make it worse than the other. It's all our depravity. And sometimes people think the whole discussion is, 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 we've lost the discussion, let me say. It's all misplaced, that's the word I'm looking for. The discussion has been misplaced. The fact that you are born into something or you're born into feeling something does not make it right. Look, I am born being attracted to women. Does that make it right? It's not right. That is why Christ came into to die for us, to redeem us, the Bible says, from the corruption of sin. Corruption of sin. That is eaten into us. So the brother the other day was talking to him, he said, Pastor, why am I attracted to men? I'm a guy. I said, it's a corruption of sin. We want to pray, we want to believe God to heal and break that corruption. Because he loves you so much. So why am I this way? So we are all like that. You express yours differently. We all have the depravity in our soul. That's the condition of our heart. It doesn't make you worse than I am. But we all have to come to the foot of the cross and say, God, deliver me. Change my heart, oh God. This is the condition of the world. He came to die. Not only is it dead, deceived, disobedient, dep deprived, the Bible also says the word also is doomed. So we become by nature the, the children of wrath. That's the world he loved. Not a perfect world. It's a world that is messed up. Somebody, I forgot to tell, someone also wanted to marry his iPhone. Seriously. It doesn't make it right. And the Bible says because of that we have become we have become the children of wrath. Judgment is coming. But for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is the extent of his love. He loved the world. The Bible also talks about not only is God's love extravagant, not only is he extensive, it's also expensive. Love will cost you something. Love is not free. If you love God and you are not a giver, something is wrong. Go back to John 3, 16. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave. Show me a Christian who loves God, and I'll show you somebody who gives. I always tell people, offering time is always a testing time. God wants to see the condition of our heart. That's why the basket are in front. That's why they are in front. To see the condition of our heart. Do we really love God? If we love God, we'll give. Or we are holding on to the material things as our, our foundation, our source, our sustainer. God so loved the world that he gave his only. Jesus Christ is the only son. God didn't have three children or four. He had only one. But God understands the cost of love. You guys here who have ever given engagement ring, you know the cost of love. It will cost you something. You know, I'm not a big believer in diamonds. One day I'll preach a message on diamonds, not today. I think you guys will stone me to death. I'm not ready to die right now. <laughs> you see, just, I still don't get it. Why somebody will spend $10,000 to buy, I won't say a stupid stone, otherwise you'll be angry with me. I won't say a useless stone because you'll be angry with me. I won't say that, I'll just say a stone. It just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense to me. But you have to buy it. Guys, that's not a reason why you don't. You have to buy it. And it will cost you. Diamonds are not cheap. And the woman, she wants it. <laughs> Basically, they are saying, you love me? Show me the what?
Love will cost you. And by the way, I've told you, if you're dating a guy who always takes you to a Chinese restaurant, break up with him. It's, not that much it's too cheap, too cheap. Love will love to spend. Oh boy, I've all of a sudden put the Chinese restaurants out of business. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is this. Jesus, God understood for, for him to love the world, it had to cost him something. Why his son? Brothers and sisters, I want you to understand this. There was nothing that is able to wash and cleanse away our sin. Goats and animals couldn't wash it because they were all sinful as we are. They are not perfect. In order for us to truly be redeemed, something that is pure, something that is perfect, something that has not been defiled, has to be sacrificed. If you read the book of Revelation chapter 4, the Bible says, and I look, and there was no one worthy to open the scroll. And at that point, God has to make a decision. Do I love this world enough to send my only begotten son? And he said, I will. God became flesh, dwelt among us. And he died on the cross. And in John chapter 1, verse 29, said the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the only one who can take sin away. So on that cross, when Jesus was crucified, every drop of blood counted. Because that is the only way, the only way our sins can truly be washed away. Washed away. Washed away. That's the only way. That's how much he loved us. You want to know how much he loved us? This is how much he loved us. Every stain of sin to be washed. The hymn writer, Robert Lovery, wrote a powerful song. He said, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Help me to sing it. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that What can, can wash, wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing 
but the blood of Jesus. No greater love. His love is so extravagant, so extensive, so expensive. But he also says the love of God is also very expansive. Reaching to all. Coming back to John 3, 16 again, he said, God so loved the world that that is God so extravagant loved the world, extensive that he gave his only begotten son, the expense of it, that whosoever. That is for everyone. Whether it is a thief on the cross that Jesus said, today you shall be with me in paradise. Or the prostitute by the well that say, come and meet a man who changed me. Or the murderer called Paul. You said, Pastor Sam, I have done so much. God cannot accept a person like me. You don't understand the power of the blood. It is whosoever. No condition attached. Whosoever. If God can forgive a Paul, you can be forgiven. Even Paul himself said in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16, 1 Timothy 1, 16, he says that I am the worst of sinners. This is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and I am the worst of them all. If God can save Paul, he can save you. I have met people who have committed murders and They've dug people and buried them and Christ begins to wrench their heart, forgive them, and they, be, they go and expose the body. And say, they walk into a police station and say, I have committed a murder 12 years ago. It is only the blood of Jesus that can do that. Paul was killing believers and Christians. If there was anybody that couldn't be forgiven, it was Paul. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus makes it very clear. He said, come to me all. Oh! Ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The message of the gospel is for all. Yes. Whosoever. Yes. That is how expansive the love of God is. Covers everybody. Whosoever. Not only is he expansive, the, the gospel also makes sure that love of God also is exclusive. And you say, Pastor Sam, how can it be expansive and exclusive at the same time? It can God has given his love to everybody, but only those that will accept that love will experience it. Are you hearing me, somebody? So he says very clearly in John, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. How expensive. That whosoever, how expensive. Believe it. It's for everyone who believes. It is exclusive. He said, Pastor, what do I need to do? I've been grown up, I grew up in church, and I want to tell you, the father you sleep in the garage does not make you a car. You can be in church all your life, but you will never believe and accept the gospel. Why should you believe? Believe that Jesus died for you. Believe that he's coming again. Believe that he will forgive you, and you believe that he's a source of your life. Believe that he has a plan for you. He has an assignment for you. He has a mission for you. He has a purpose for you. Believe that he's your God. He created the universe. Believe and accept him. He said to the thief on the cross, he said, today you shall be with me in paradiso. He was a thief. He has never stepped into a church before, but he's in the kingdom of God. All that he takes is to believe. He never sang in the choir, but he's in the kingdom of God. He said, Lord, remember me in your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you shall be with me in paradise. Do you believe? Or do you just do the church thing? You come to church every Sunday and an altar call is made and you go, this is not for me, this is not for me. I've done the church thing. But deep in your heart, Christ is in the center of your life. Today you can change it. Thank you, Jesus. I feel angels around this place right now. I feel angels around here. I feel them, I feel them right here. Angels are here. If you give your life to him today, God is ready to throw a party. The angels are here to, 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 to let the rest of the angels above know that somebody has given his life to Christ. The love of God is so exclusive. 
Will you believe today? Psalm 63 verse 3 says, because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. What does it mean is better than life? Let me tell you, if Christ is in the center of your life, life is meaningless. And you know what I'm saying is true. You know it. Life is empty. Life is just, 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 just meaningless without Christ. That is why God's love in your life is better than life. Amen. Let me finish up today. In Acts chapter 16, verse 30, they, he brought them out and said to them, Say, what must I do to be saved? Then Paul said to them, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Not only is God's love expansive, it's also exceptional. Now listen to me. Say, for God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him, should not perish. It is never, never or ever be the intention of God that anybody should go to hell. Are you hearing me, somebody? Never, never. There are two kinds of road everybody must take when you die. Only two roads. Contrary to what they tell you, contrary to what you may, you may study in a university or others may tell you, these are all lies. I'm here to tell you, when you die, you're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. You have only two choices. And you can decide where you're going, which road you are taking. You need to decide. In about 30 years or 40 years, most of us in this room will not be alive. Let me ask you something today. Where will you be? Which road are you going to be? So when I was born in church, I'm not talking about being born in church. I was singing the choir. No, I want to know, is Christ your Savior? Is he your Lord? Is it Jesus Christ, your Lord and personal Savior? Is he in your soul? God doesn't want anybody. In Ezekiel, he makes it very clear. It breaks my heart. I don't want anybody to choose the other way. He said to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of a wicked. God does not rejoice. That is why he says, should not perish. People go to hell that they should not have. God so loved the world that he that believes in him should not perish. I don't take pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and leave. And leave. Turn. Turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? God said, I don't take pleasure. Again, in the book of Peter, the Bible makes it very clear, the same idea. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, should not perish. I'm sure that when the world is over and God will take a look at the people, the Bible says, broad is a way that leads to destruction and many are those on the road. Christ is going to look at them and say, you should not have perished. Should not perish. And every day it weeps over the people that are going to hell like the way he wept over Jerusalem. He said, oh, Jerusalem, like a mother hen who tried to gather his children, you will never be, a, you, you, you refuse to be gathered. And God wept over a city and I believe he's weeping over a people and he's saying, should not perish, should not perish. Cynthia, you should not perish. George, you should not perish. Are you hearing my voice? God said, I should tell you, you should not perish. And then finally, he says, should not perish, but have an everlasting life. That is God's love is eternal. For God so loved the world, he says, that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God wants to spend the rest of eternity with you. That's how much he loves you. And next week, I'm going to conclude this series with that. That God loves you so much, he wants to spend eternity with you. Not just here. Not just for the moment. God said, I'm not just married to you just because I'm alive here or you are alive here. He said, I want you to be with me forever. You should not perish. Can we say it together? John 3, 16. Let's go. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What have we said today? We have said seven things about this verse. It is extravagant. It is extensive. It is expensive. It is expansive. It is exclusive. It is except exceptional. And it's going to be forever. Has God spoken to somebody here today?